Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is a very difficult case because it's such a tragic and horrifying situation to talk about but I wanted to come on here and tell you guys about this case because while it's still a very recent case, I wanted to bring this to your attention because this seems to be a huge issue right now. Women and children are dying and fathers are killing their families and it's just such an unspeakable tragedy that's happening right now and this case is a very good example of that. So with that being said, let's just go ahead and get started with this case. So, 40-year-old Tasha Haight was married to a 42-year-old man named Michael Haight who worked as an insurance agent. According to his obituary, which we will discuss more in a few minutes, Tasha and Michael met while attending Southern Utah University and they became married on May 10th, 2003. And together, they welcomed five children, a 17-year-old named Macy, 12-year-old Briley, 7-year-old twins Ammon and Sienna, and 4-year-old Gavin. They all lived in a home in the small town of Enoch, Utah, which has a population of around 8,000 people and is located just outside of Cedar City in Southern Utah. The children attended a public school in the Iron County School District. The school was described as all being close to one another, being described as a place where schools become families. They were also members of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, and the family were very, very devout in their beliefs. Tasha's mother, Gail Earl, was born on May 30th, 1944 in Laverk in Utah, and she was the youngest of seven children. She went on to get married to her husband, Boyd Earl, and the two of them went on to have seven children of their own. She was described as a dedicated mother who made sure to give her all to each and every one of her children so that each of them all felt like the most important thing in her life. She loved traveling, playing the piano, and making quilts, and she was dedicated to her faith at the LDS Church. Tasha Earl Haight was born on January 19, 1982. She graduated from Moeba Valley High School in 1999 and then went on to Southern Utah University, graduating in 2004 with a bachelor's degree in child development. The family describes that Tasha loved making homemade fresh bread for her children and she was known for how perfect and delicious her homemade bread was. Tasha was a huge planner, planning everything from talking to her children about what she wanted them to say when she eventually passed away, to the day-to-day -day comings of family life. Tasha had a very deep love for nature, and she grew up with her mother, Gail, passing down the teachings from the LDS church. Because of this, Tasha grew a deep love for her church, and she took after her mother in making sure to never miss a scripture lesson. Tasha's siblings described that Tasha was an incredible mother who constantly sacrificed everything for her children. She taught her children kindness, love, service, and dedication to the gospel of the church by living through example. Tasha especially loved her role that she had with serving as president for the young woman group in her local church. She taught so many young girls who really looked up to her, and she cherished the time that she got to spend with them. She had so many goals and aspirations in her life, but being the best mother she possibly could was the biggest joy in her life. 17-year-old Macy, the oldest of five children, was born on October 13th, 2005. She was known for being a huge help to her mother when it came to raising her four younger siblings. She always played games with them, helped them with their homework, helped them with their chores, and helped them get ready for bed. She was set to graduate from high school this year, in 2023. She had planned on going to her parents' alma mater, Southern Utah University, working towards a degree in digital marketing. She liked teasing others and her family, but she always reminded others that it was said with love. Her favorite color was yellow, and she had always looked forward to becoming a mom someday. She, too, was active in the church, and she had many friends at school. 12-year-old Briley was born on September 28, 2010. She was described as kind, thoughtful, and tender-hearted. She was always thinking of others. She was described as a master at the piano and the cello, and she actually memorized all of her musical pieces. She was known to constantly be singing or humming. She wanted to grow up to be a librarian because she absolutely loved reading books. 
She would literally read all day if she was allowed to. She would always recount her favorite plots and she couldn't wait to tell others the best part of each book so that they could be excited about reading that book too. She loved spending time with her friends and going to church when she wasn't reading or listening to music. Seven-year-old Ammon and Sienna were born on June 21st, 2015. Ammon was described as being a smart, logical young boy. He was known for loving jokes and riddles. He was imaginative, curious, and he loved to learn about anything that moved. He loved building Legos and had just finished making a Lego model of the Titanic, which he was so excited about getting just that previous Christmas in 2022. His twin, Sienna, was described as having a bright, vivacious personality. She loved to take pictures with her camera and put funny filters on them. She was very studious at school and she loved everything about cats, even dressing up as a cat every year for Halloween. She also loved riddles and jokes and she had a deep love for her friends and especially her sisters. The youngest, four-year-old Gavin. He was described as having just this most mischievous grin. He was rambunctious and he loved to get into trouble and you always had to wonder what kind of trouble he was going to get himself into. He was always coloring all over the walls of the family home. A family member said that there weren't picture frames all over the walls, it was murals that Gavin made. They would paint the walls to cover the drawings and he would just draw right over them once again. He loved superheroes. He was very affectionate with family members describing that his hugs were like football tackles. He loved to give and receive tickles, and his little smile could just light up your world. Now, from the outside, as you can imagine, the family seemed like your typical small-town family. They went to church. They were very devout in their faith. They were active in the community, and their children were known around the high school and in the community. However, there was more going on behind the scenes that made it seem that the family wasn't all that it seemed. By December 21st, Tasha Height filed for divorce. By December 27th, her lawyer served Michael with the divorce papers. We don't know the details of why she filed for divorce or anything like that, as those records have been sealed right now. We do know that, per Tasha's reporting at this point, Tasha had never expressed any fear of her husband or made any sort of accusations of being physically abusive or anything like that, as far as her lawyer knows, though I will note that her lawyer only really met up with her, I think, two times before all of this happened. However, there are other things that may have been going on behind the scenes that we will discuss in just a few minutes. But either way, by the morning of January 4th, 2023, Tasha was sent to attend an appointment. I'm not exactly sure what the appointment was, but of course, she did not show. This was unusual enough for her that the person that she was meeting with actually called the authorities and requested that they do a wellness check for her. However, the officer that arrived to the home, he walked into something that was the absolute worst possible case scenario that someone could walk into. I can't even imagine thinking like, oh, she probably just slept or she probably is just out and forgot about the appointment, but walking into what this officer walked into. This officer found that the entire family had been murdered, all by apparent gunshot wounds. Tasha, Macy, Briley, Ammon, Sienna, Gavin, Tasha's mother, Gail, and Michael were all dead. Right away, it was clear to the police that Michael had shot every member of this family before taking his own life. Once again, we don't know the exact reasons as to why, but people have suspected that it could have to do with the fact that Tasha just filed for divorce two weeks prior to this. Of course, after finding out about this horrible tragedy, the community as a whole were absolutely devastated. No one in this small town could wrap their head around how or why something like this could happen. Mayor Jeffrey Chestnut gave a statement saying that Enoch is a very close community. No one wants to leave the area because the people there are so close to one another. He said, quote, The neighbors are good, the people are wonderful, and the efforts that we make on one another's behalf is like family. Every student at Iron County School District were all affected by the deaths. 
Every student knew one another, and so did the staff. They all knew the students. And again, all of these children grew up together because it was such a small, tight-knit community. School officials said that even students in schools that the children did not attend were reeling just because of how many people knew the Haight family. However, after all of this came out, the community and those on social media were all outraged at the obituary that was posted for Michael. After murdering his entire family, including his mother-in-law, the obituary wrote a long paragraph about how great of a person he was. Initially, it started off by talking about his early life, saying that he loved playing sports like baseball, basketball, and soccer. He was an Eagle Scout who loved doing outdoor activities. They talked about how he was so involved in his church, going to various countries for his missions trips. I'm not going to read all of that. I'm just going to summarize it here because I don't think that that part deserves to be told whatsoever. But after that, it gets into the real meat of this monstrosity. It lists each one of the children as well as when the two of them got married. After that, it reads, quote, each of these children were truly a cherished miracle to them. Michael made it a point to spend quality time with each and every one of his children. Michael enjoyed making memories with his family. He spent many evenings and Saturdays coaching the children's city league sporting teams, attending children's concerts at school, going on side-by-side -side rides, doing home improvement projects, sledding, and much more. Michael lived a life of service. Whether it was serving in the church or in the community, he was willing to help with whatever was needed. Michael owned and operated a successful insurance agency, receiving many awards and honors for his achievements. Many of his clients loved and appreciated the care and attention that he gave to them. Michael recently sold his business to spend more time with his family. And a lot of the comments on his obituary were of past clients and people who knew him outside of his family just talking about how great of a person he was, how, you know, he took so much time and care with their insurance claims and as clients and things like that. And as you can imagine, people were really upset at the fact that people were referring to Michael as a family man who made sure to spend time with his family when he literally murdered all of them. People were upset that his clients were going on there and vouching for him and talking about how great of a person he was, even though he just murdered his entire family. To me, he lost his status as a family man who loved his family and spent time with them when he murdered all of them. Especially on social media, people were absolutely outspoken about how ridiculous it was that this was even posted. In response, the website that originally posted it, The Spectrum, apologized for posting it, saying that, you know, it's funeral homes that typically write these obituaries and send them to them to post. It has since been removed, but of course, there are posts of this all over social media, so that's how I was able to read the obituary. So now let's talk about the other aspects of this case that shows that this may have been something that was brewing behind the scenes for quite a while. So we know that this family had several guns and they were trained with them to protect themselves. It turned out that two weeks before the murder-suicide, Michael had removed all of the guns from the house. Tasha told family members of this, and they aren't exactly sure how she felt about this or what she thought about this. But some friends and family members have said that they think that Michael did this on purpose in order to make it impossible for the family to defend themselves since, you know, Tasha and her mother were very well trained with firearms for personal protection. They reported that they had these guns to protect their own lives. Once again, the family said that they didn't know what Tasha thought about the removal of the guns, but it left the family vulnerable. Because the authorities aren't exactly sure how the whole situation took place, they don't know if having the guns would have protected them from Michael. However, once again, Gail and Tasha were both trained gun owners, so many people think that they would have survived had they had their own firearms for protection. The fact that this happened literally two weeks before this murder-suicide took place makes me think that, you know, he was finding out about the divorce, he was served with the papers, and then immediately removed the firearms from the home and was planning on a day that he was going to carry out this entire thing. But either way, the family stated, quote, Protective firearms were purposely removed from the home prior to the incident because all adults were properly trained to protect human life. 
This is the type of loss that will continue to occur in families, communities, and this nation when protective firearms are no longer accessible. They've also said that they want the media focus on their family to be around the loss of life and how precious life is rather than using this for a political matter for, you know, gun control and things like that, which I do understand. Nobody wants to see, you know, their tragedy being used politically. I personally wouldn't, whether it be on either side. I wouldn't want to use a tragedy in my life as something political for a party to gain off of. So I do understand that. And so that is all I'm going to say about that. You guys can say what you want in the comments, but that's where I'm going to leave it out of respect for the family. Then it also came out that in 2020, Michael was actually being investigated for child abuse, though he was never charged. However, it came out that Macy Haight told authorities that her father had been assaultive with her a few times over the past few years. With this incident and reporting, both Macy and her mother were interviewed separately from each other and separately from Michael, and he too was interviewed in all of this. Macy reported about three different incidences that had occurred over the course of three years, saying that she was terrified that her father was going to hurt her. In one incident, she said that they were in the family's piano room where Michael became so angry that he grabbed her by the shoulders and then shook her and then banged her head into a wooden piece along the back of the couch. She wasn't seriously injured with this. She wasn't injured at all, but obviously this left her terrified. In another situation, she said that they were in the pantry when Michael became so angry that he grabbed her around the neck and choked her. She said that she was afraid that he was going to stop her from breathing and kill her. However, sources reported that she did walk back her statement a little bit and she said that she didn't actually lose her breath and she didn't sustain an injury from this, but once again, this really scared her. Then in a third situation, she said that they were in the garage when her father grabbed her by her shoulders and shook her, but once again, she did not have any injury from this. In this same incident, Macy told investigators that Michael would often belittle and yell at his wife and their mother in front of them. She said that Michael would often call her stupid and lazy. She said that she would defend her mother, but when she did so, that just made Michael get angrier. She said that sometimes Michael would take Tasha's phone away from her to prevent her from being able to leave the house. When Michael was interviewed, he denied having abused his daughter or Tasha or any of his other children, though he did admit that there was a misunderstanding where he said that Macy had been mouthy and he admitted to getting angry, maybe even losing his temper, saying that he was struggling with his father's death as well as his brother's divorce. So, that was basically his excuse for flying off the wall. Then it was reported that he did admit that he had taken his wife's iPad and her cell phone to check her text messages to see if she had said anything negative about his family. He said that he believed that she was talking to her sister about his sister and his mother, so he wanted to read those text messages. After Michael was interviewed and police did a follow-up, Tasha asked the authorities if they thought that the family was in danger to which the officer said that there's no sign of him growing towards violent behaviors. Later, the police said that this incident didn't meet the criteria for being an assault that charges can actually be filed for. It was stated, though, that Tasha told investigators that she didn't necessarily want to press charges against Michael, that she was just hoping that this whole thing served as a wake-up call for him. Of course, people in the media and people in the community were upset that police may have missed the warning signs. However, they did report that they took the report seriously and did a thorough investigation. They released a statement saying, quote, Following the procedures outlined in Utah State Code Title 63G, Chapter 2, Government Records Access and Management Act, various news outlets requested information regarding previous incidents with the Haight family. These records, with the redaction of private information, were provided to these news outlets. This release has resulted in inquiries as to policy and procedures adhered to by law enforcement in connection with these incidents. The Enoch City Police Department takes each report of child abuse and domestic violence seriously and thoroughly investigates each and every allegation reported. 
In regards specifically to Michael Haight, the Inuk City Police Department received information from the Department of Family and Child Services related to allegations of abuse by Michael Haight. Investigators conducted interviews with Macy Haight, Michael Haight, and Tasha Earl Haight concerning the alleged child abuse. These interviews were conducted separately and in accordance with best practices where Macy Haight was interviewed separately at the Iron County Children's Justice Center by individuals with specialized training related to child abuse. As a part of the investigative process, the Enoch City Police Department staffs all investigations where a CJC interview is conducted with a multi-interagency team that includes DCFS, the CJC, Victims Advocates, and the Iron County Attorney's Office and others. This was done to provide ongoing support for Tasha Earl Haight and Macy Haight. Once the investigation was completed by the Enoch City Police Department and DCFS, the Enoch City Police Department communicated with the Iron County Attorney's Office and reviewed the details of the investigation. After this review, it was determined that this case did not meet the elements required by statute for prosecution. A lethality assessment was completed with Tasha Haight. Her responses to the lethality assessment did not indicate a lethal relationship. However, victim services were made available to Tasha and her family for several months. We join in mourning with our neighbors, friends, and Earl and Haight families and with all who have felt the shock and pain of this trauma. The outpouring of compassion for all involved continues to be kind and appreciated. We join with families in making those who have given prayers and other means of support for everyone impacted. So basically what they're saying is that after their thorough investigation, talking to everybody involved, they just did not think that there was any lethality to this. They did not think that a fatal incident like this would have occurred. So that is what we know about this case so far. I am so, so sad about this tragedy once again, and it definitely should not have happened. My heart hurts for the family, and especially those children. I'm really looking forward to hearing more that comes out after this case as a more detailed timeline comes out as well as the autopsy reports, but that is where I'm going to end the case. It is obviously frustrating that the police couldn't have prevented this. I obviously wish the police could have done more to help Tasha and her family and give them the resources to get out of there if they needed to. And I just wish that, you know, with this history of abuse and knowing that these violent outbursts had happened, that once she filed for divorce, I just wish something could have been done to protect her. I don't know what she thought was going to happen with this divorce. We don't know why this divorce was even filed, but if I would assume, or I would guess, I would think that it has something to do with these outbursts and with his behaviors that obviously she was getting very, very tired of. So I just wish more could have been done once, you know, something like this was going to happen, once he was going to be, you know, on the receiving end of divorce papers. I just wish more could have been done, but I am looking forward to hearing more about the investigation that comes out about this. If he did have any more like serious behaviors in the days before this, other than just removing all the firearms from the home, I'm really looking forward to hearing anything else that comes out about this. But I'm hoping that they don't just close up this case because of the fact that the perpetrator is dead. I hope that we find out more and I hope that they release more information. So that is where I'm going to end this case and that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put a new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!